Hi everyone, uh, this is lecture 7.1. Uh, we'll be talking about the war on gangs. So in this lecture, we will be looking at a historical overview of uh, how we have dealt with gangs and how what gangs have looked like in the United States uh, for about the last 150 years. Uh, we'll talk specifically about the push that was called the war on gangs. Um, and then we'll talk about the consequences of that uh, political push. So first, a historical overview. Uh, gang behavior has a very, very, very long history. And actually, the phenomena itself is very uh, similar to uh, tribalism, uh, being uh, for the coalition and collection of a certain set of uh, cultural identities. And it's important to point out that tribal does not necessarily imply primitive. Um, here we see, of course, these are reenactors, um, reenactors from uh, ancient European uh, tribes. And then when we compare that, though, and they here are trying to look aggressive, right? Then we look at pictures of gang members and, you know, they look utterly different, but you can really see the similarities, right? You can uh, see the symbols that are on their shields and then symbols being used uh, by gang signs. You can uh, see preferred color schemes and then for color schemes, uh, it looks like here that the specific type of uh, black jacket uh, as well is tied in with all of that. Um, so, like, obviously, we see two very different pictures here, but we see uh, the similarities. Uh, gangs do exist in most societies. It's not a uh, usually a thing we're super proud of, but uh, a gang, a clan, a tribe, and a nation are actually relatively similar concepts. Uh, where they differ are in terms of uh, size, and in terms of the age of the organization. Uh, it's very interesting. Gangs have not always been seen as dangerous. Uh, well, I'm sorry, let me finish that sentence uh, fully. Gangs have not always been seen as dangerous collections of African-American or Latino youth. Uh, gangs are typically seen as dangerous by those outside of the gangs, but they have not always been tied with uh, Latino youth and with uh, African American youth. Uh, it was a movie, but uh, in the movie, film Gangs of New York, I believe it came out in the early 2000s, uh, we see depictions of uh, I Irish gangs and uh, quote native, use, we use this term loosely, uh, people who are native to America, gangs, not Native Americans, but basically white people that were there first. Um, this from the film is uh, the the American nativist gang, uh, and these gang those gangs did exist uh, during that period in the uh, mid 1800s in New York City. Here we have see a picture of the Purple Gang that uh, ran Chicago for uh, for a long time. Uh, and they actually were a predominantly Jewish gang. We don't uh, typically associate uh, Jewish people with uh, gangsterism and gangs. But um, during uh, the early part of the 20th century, it, it was a real thing. And in the United States, uh, gangs are typically more common in urban areas. Uh, the reason for this is that marginalized group often collect in groups often collect in cities uh, for that safety and security. And one phenomena that occurs when there is a large marginalized group is that gangs develop in order to protect those marginalized groups because police forces often um, either are overtly hostile toward the marginalized groups or don't pay them as much attention as they do the dominant and powerful groups in society. Thus, uh, gangs form. Additionally, in the United States, gangs are often countercultural. So uh, we will define counterculture as having different values and norms than the dominant culture and openly challenging the dominant culture. This varies from a subculture 
because subcultures uh, tend to coexist in societies, while countercultures, i.e. gangs and other uh, groups that go against the culture, have a harder time coexisting with the culture. Thus, what they do is deemed illegal. Uh, they're put in prison, etc. Now, people don't just join gangs uh, for frivolous reasons. Uh, they usually don't even join gangs because they perceive them as being fun. Uh, sociologists have found, uh, I believe it was uh, Cloward and Owen, I might be wrong on that, they found that uh, people join gangs in search of respect. So the most typical people to join a gang is a young man or a teen, teenage man or boy. Uh, they join gangs in order to gain respect. And the reason why they join the gang to gain respect is because they have little opportunity otherwise to uh, gain respect uh, in uh, their community. Uh, people additionally join gangs for protection. So there might, people might uh, recognize that it's dangerous to be in a gang. They're not really in it for that respect angle, uh, but they might be actually afraid of the police in their community. Or they could be in a situation where they're afraid of other gangs as well, and thus that could drive them to uh, join the gang. Um, people often join gangs uh, for a sense of family or community. Uh, we often refer to this as uh, fictive kinship uh, because people who seek, who lack family, who lack community, often seek to build that family where it hasn't existed otherwise. Uh, in terms of gangs, this would be young people that don't really have a strong family structure. Uh, we also see fictive kinship in, uh, especially in women's prisons, and we also see fictive kinship among LGBT youth who have been disowned uh, by their families. There are yet additional reasons people join gangs. So if a gang is well established enough over a matter of decades, then they can become uh, social institutions. And these social institutions can become so established that they actually create legitimate community organizations. Uh, a good example of this is what has occurred in New York City uh, with uh, the gang or collection of gangs known as the Zulu Nation. Uh, Zulu Nation uh, focuses on African identity and African American identity uh, surrounding hip hop. And uh, Zulu Nation, uh, while still a mediumly abrasive type group and an insular kind of group, they are a group that does community building in those areas now. Uh, they have uh, concerts, they have uh, nonprofit. Uh, branches, they have a really strong identity in those communities. Uh, and which is, you know, like I said, there's not much difference between a gang, a clan, and uh, what could be hypothetically maybe eventually a nation, if you will. It should also be pointed out, and obviously, that gangs are also common in our prison system in the United States. Uh, gangs serve many of the same purposes as gangs outside of prisons. Uh, prison gangs may extend uh, outside the prison, so the, the prison gang itself might have people on the outside to smuggle uh, things in that the prisoners may want or need. Uh, the general public generally has expressed less concern for prison gangs than other gangs. That's the big difference, is that prison gangs basically exist and people acknowledge and know they exist. And public policy and politics rarely get uh, really excited about what occurs with uh, prisons and what occurs in prison gangs, uh, while uh, public policy and politicians may very get very upset about gangs and communities, which is what really spurned on the war on gangs, which we'll talk about in a moment. Additionally, it should be pointed out, uh, something you don't see as much in gangs on the outside are uh, the dominance of white supremacist gangs in prison. So neo-Nazis and similar ideological gangs uh, surrounding race, you don't see that as much uh, outside of prison. There are certain gangs that have uh, slight, you know, racial ideologies, but it's, it's, it's not uh, as heavy as it is in prison, and you certainly don't see the white supremacist gangs uh, nearly as much on the outside as you do in prison.
So let's talk specifically about this thing called the War on Gangs. So what was it? Uh, the War on Gangs was a political push in the 1980s and 1990s that attempted to reduce gang membership and imprison gang members. Uh, this occurred at the same time as the war on drugs and tough on crime political pushes. Uh, it is uh, reasonable to conjecture that maybe they called it the war on gangs because the war on drugs was so popular. There might have been a, na a level of like name stealingness uh, there. Uh, it's not really possible to know that, uh, but definitely they were trying to do the same thing. So... Goffman's stigma theory, uh, you may remember Goffman from Social 101, really influential sociologist. Uh, Goffman uh, stated that there are groups in society that we stigmatize, and those groups that we stigmatize are usually the ones that are most discriminated against. So if we apply stigma theory to the, the war on gangs, uh, he would point out that the war on gangs was not about gangs, it was about race. And even though crimes uh, no longer uh, specifically targeted black people, so uh, for it, that shouldn't say crimes, that should say laws, no, even though laws no longer specifically target black people. Uh, so things like segregation. In the 1980s and 90s, segregation was long in the past, right? Uh, even though during that era, white people were still afraid of black people. And there are still today many white people who are afraid of black people. So what Goffman points out is that gangs serve as proxies. I'll find proxy and other for in a second. Gangs serve as proxies for the other. And uh, in doing that, they were targets of these tough on crime, these war on gangs political stances. So a proxy is a stand-in uh, for, for something that we are afraid of. So in this case, gangs, when people are talking about gangs, they're really talking about we need laws to regulate young black males. And in this instance, the other is a group or type of person who is not part of the mainstream, i.e. from Goffman's theoretical stance, a stigmatized minority group. What's, so, so what Goffman's saying is that, as I already said, uh, gangs, when people were talking about gangs in the 80s and 90s and talking about a war on gangs and the need for a war on gangs, effectively what he's saying is we need to regulate young black men. Why? Uh, because we are afraid of young black men. Were any politicians openly saying that? No, of course they weren't. But that was the subtext. Those were the cues. Those were the dog whistles to people that everyone knows what you're actually talking about. You're talking about, you know, we need to stop young black men. But the wording was that of gangs. Thus, the racial composition of gangs changed, right? So what? how, how did this all happen? Um, who was in gangs uh, was shifting in many cities, right? It was no longer white kids, it was black kids. So thus our perception, because we do live unfortunately in a society with a lot of racial hangups, because gangs were no longer white, they were now black or then black. Uh, when gangs were white, we saw gangs maybe as delinquents, as in, this is a picture from West Side Story, if you don't know. Uh, so maybe relatively harmless, maybe a little rough around the edges, tough guys, but um, not necessarily someone who's going to point a gun at you uh, in that sort of way. So uh, we went from seeing gangs as like, juvenile delinquents who could be the feature of a musical, as in West Side Story, to uh, these vicious gangster rappers who were out to kill us all, right? And that's how gangs were depicted, and young black men were depicted in the 1990s. The fact of the matter is that crime rates fell dramatically during the 80s and 90s, and exactly when these um, gangs and fears of gangs 
uh, were rising precipitously. Actually, crime rates started to fall uh, just a little bit before we became so afraid of gangs. So uh, the fact of the matter is that they're, they're not related is the thing. So let's talk about some of the consequences of the war on gangs and are focusing on what happened politically, what happened policy-wise, because people were so afraid of gangs during this era. So uh, there were trends in incarceration rates relating to gangs. So the way we put people in prison uh, changed. Uh, traditional media outlets play a crucial role in demonizing gang members, especially during this era. Uh, keep in mind, this was a time where a lot of parts of the country still only had three major networks, right? There were only three channels on TV, right? A lot of people didn't even didn't have cable at this time. There certainly wasn't social media. Uh, the internet was not a thing yet. So the only thing you had to consume were the things that was on the TV, and those things on the TV were saying that gangs were coming and going to basically kill us all. Um, this had the effect of exaggerating the activities of gang members and making them look more dangerous. Additionally, gang-involved juveniles were being routinely prosecuted as if they were adults. And this continues to this day because of the laws put into place that juveniles who are involved with gangs, so a 16-year-old who's a member of a gang that gets in some legal trouble, that 16-year-old goes from being uh, considered a non-adult to being considered an adult. And that changes so much in terms of what that person can do after they get out of prison, how long they're going to be in prison, um, the, the consequences of their action as a 16 year old. And we all remember, we all did really stupid things when we were 16. Gang violence provided a backdrop for development of a variety of so-called magic bullets, which are um, were seen as the cure. There's a reason I have the uh, in quotes there. It was seen as like the cure. The magic bullet was going to fix everything. Uh, that, that's the term we use. Uh, magic bully, bullet uh, solutions are often dis disproportionately punishing of racial minorities and of poor people. Uh, that's another thing to point out about those kinds of uh, policy pushes. So uh, let's look at a couple of specific uh, policy pushes uh, that could possibly be labeled as magic bullet pushes. Uh, we look at sentencing enhancement. So th these are laws that add time to a sentence uh, because of someone being a gang member. So if you would rob a liquor store and you were not a gang member, you could, for, I'm making these numbers up, you could, for example, get five years in prison. Well, if you are part of a gang, or maybe you're wearing a red shirt that day and you're in Bloods territory uh, and they perceive you to be part of a gang, you could get an additional five years put onto that five years, thus being in 10 years for prison uh, for a, a poor, very poor decision. Uh, gang injunctions were another policy change. So these are civil orders that prohibit named gang members from associated with one another, congregating in specific eras, or doing things stipulating in the injunction. And that is a, that sounds like something that could be like, yeah, that's a good idea, right? Uh, once gang members get out, we don't want them talking to other gang members or people related to gangs. The fact of the matter is that when people get out of prison, though, they need community. They need their friends. They need people that they knew before. And if they are forced to cut ties with all of these people that they knew before, it has the effect of increasing recidivism. Recidivism being going back to prison and committing more crimes. So actually, by cutting off the ties of an individual, even if some of those individuals had been gang in gangs in the past, what we're doing is actually increasing the chance that the person will commit additional crime. So these contributions 
uh, sentencing enhancement, gang injunctions, other policy changes done as part of the war on gangs actually contributed significantly to the disproportionate number of African Americans in prison compared to other racial groups. Uh, if you, I, I, I'm pretty sure I've used this uh, point of this out previously in the class. Uh, there are about 35% of the prison population is African American, while only 12% of the uh, the United States population is African American. That is largely due that that twenty percent disparity is due to uh, these kinds of policy issues. There are also uh, a number of relevant court cases uh, that have uh, that came after the war on gangs that uh, kind of uh, changed a lot of the ways that these laws are impl uh, are put into place. Uh, Miller v. Alabama decided in 2012 that a sentence of life without parole for juveniles was unconstitutional. Uh, that is relevant relating to gangs because many gang members are under 18. Uh, so that that is relevant to how gang uh, policy is used. Uh, Roper v. Simmons in 2005 declared that death penalty was unconstitutional for youth under 18 as well. Uh, so uh, these are both relating to, uh, you know, really serious crimes, right? Life sentence without parole, death penalty without parole. Uh, so um, that, you know, that changes the way a lot of uh, so-called gang uh, crimes are punished. Okay, so that is uh, the lecture for this time. Uh, if you have any questions, please let me know. And uh, as always, if you notice anything that needs attention in the course, please let me know. Thanks.